Last Sunday, we began a, a new teaching series in Ecclesiastes called All is Not Vanity in Christ. And <clears throat> we focused on information regarding the book itself. We talked about the title and the author and the date of writing and the purpose of the book, why it was written. And we did this to kind of shape our initial understanding of the book and to maybe build some context as we begin to move into it. Um, adding to that, the book of Ecclesiastes is basically divided into three sections or parts. Uh, begins with a, a short prologue um, introducing some of the themes of Coalette's, that's the main author, Coalette's thought, and we see that in chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, and then it continues from there with a, a very long monologue from Coalette, and we see that in chapter 1, verses 12, all the way through chapter 12, verse 7, and then the book concludes with a brief epilogue in chapter 12, verses 8 to 14. So that's kind of how it's divided. You've got 11 verses, and then you've got a really big section, and then you shrink back down in the epilogue with just a handful of verses as well. So that's kind of the way it's divided. Uh, the prologue and the epilogue are differentiated from the body of the book by their third-person references to Kohelet. Um, together they frame Kohelet's speech, the center of Ecclesiastes. That's actually the speech section, and, and it's made up primarily of autobiographical reflections on the meaning of life. And uh, this is that portion, that speech section, is where the main author, Kohelet, assumes the persona or adopts the persona of Solomon and then presents Solomon's wisdom. And now, Solomon's wisdom is just biblical divine wisdom, but that's the character and historical figure that Kohelet is, if you want to say, channeling in a sense. Um, and, and so, uh, and now it would appear that, and, and what I would say is the middle section, the speech section, before I move any further, it's almost... You almost want to think of it as a voice from the past section. Because as we talked about last Sunday, I'm not convinced that Solomon was the actual author, and that's the historical view. But I think that there's so many later down the road references that kind of disqualify him. So in a way, what Kohelet does, that's the teacher, the one who gathers people, that's the main author, the speech giver, He's just pretending to be Solomon in that section and then espousing Solomon's wisdom. It's the voice of the past section. It would appear that the prologue and epilogue were written by someone other than Kohelet. Uh, the third person references seem to reveal this. Um, and uh, that kind of writing or, or you know, taking on a, an alternate personality and, and speaking on behalf of someone, if you want to call it that. It wasn't uncommon in antiquity at all, especially among the ancient Mesopotamian writers. There were a lot of times that you would have an author that would write as if he were someone from the past, and I think that's what we see here. It's not even Kohelet speaking yet um, when we first get into this. Think of the structure of the book like this, like when you start thinking epilogue and prologue and all these things and log in your eye, log, 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 what is this? Think of it like this. Ecclesiastes has an introduction. How many of you read books? Most of us do, right? And when we read books, a lot of times the book that we're about to read has an introduction that was written by someone else who describes the author describes the body of work the author is involved with. Maybe they describe some of the features of the book or the literary style of it. And so a prologue is essentially an introduction. A great many of the theological books I read have an introduction that was written by someone else. I could 
read a book by James Montgomery Boyce, but Steve Lawson wrote the introduction, and then maybe somebody else wrote the epilogue, the closing statements. And so I think that's exactly what you see here. We're about to begin, or we're about to look at the prologue today, and it is like an introduction to the book. And it's obviously not written, because of all the third person references, it's obviously not written by Kohelet. We don't hear his voice until verse 12 of chapter 1. So think of this first portion, this prologue, as an introduction. Again, this was written how many thousand years ago? So that literary style has been around for a very long time. You see it today, you see it back then. Um, uh, you could even call it a foreword rather than an introduction if you want to call it that. In, in the foreword here, in the prologue, in the introduction, the writer, our writer speaks of the main author and even speaks as if he is that person in a way. And then he does talk about the book's content from a third person perspective. So this morning, we're going to begin our exposition and focus on the prologue, uh, which is recorded in chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, as I said. If you want to, you can turn there now. That'd be good. And for teaching purposes, I have divided the prologue into three sections, which will serve as our three main points. When I divide something like that and give it all matching letters and all that, it's the matching letter part that is my, my little quirk. Uh, but the prologue actually does have three devoted sections, and so that's not something that I made up. So hopefully you've turned there, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 11. I'll pray for God's help as we begin to dive in, or before we do that. Lord. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for the heartfelt, spirit-filled worship that we just had and for our musicians and our singer, and it was just um, inspiring, I think, and encouraging and um, exalting you is the most encouraging thing we could do for ourselves. And so I really enjoyed that time, and I now pray firstly for myself, Lord, that I didn't get a chance to pray in the back. and. I just pray that you would guide me and lead me through your spirit as I unpack this prologue from the text and uh, cause me and help me to say exactly what you want said. And sometimes that's exactly what I've already scripted through the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it's a little different, but I just pray that um, I would get out of the way in a sense and let you speak through me. And I pray that our, our audience, our congregation this morning would be attentive and their ears would be open, their eyes would be open, and most of all, their hearts would be open to the truth. Um, you have a, even though we're only looking at an introduction or a prologue or a foreword, um, it is still chock full of important biblical truth that we need to hear, that we need to believe, and that we need to obey and live. And so, uh, you know, we don't have to wait to hear from Kohelet to be instructed. And so, Lord, we just submit ourselves to you now and pray that you receive all the glory through our attention and through us uh, applying the word here. And we love you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we can begin with our first point of the prologue, okay? And the first thing we see is the superscription, verse 1. And here is what... I call him the frame narrator. That's the person that basically wrote the prologue and the epilogue. Here, are the, here is the frame narrator speaking on Kohelet's behalf. Verse 1, he says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Let me just stop there. The book opens with a superscription that includes the, uh, the speech of Kohelet in in uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 12, 7, that, the superscription is basically introducing that massive section of this book, the centerpiece or the speech. That's what the superscription does here. Uh, and it is really just the opening line of an 11 verse section that prepares us, the listeners and the readers. Uh, for what follows and, and what the intent of the, of the superscription and really the prologue is, is just to prepare or to help us understand the frame of mind and, and even the, 
the mood or to set the mood for Kohelet's thought, which will begin in verse 12. As I said earlier, the prologue and epilogue were probably written by a second unnamed wisdom teacher. As I said, I'm calling this person the frame narrator. Um, and then, as I said before, we're not going to hear from Kohelet till verse 12. Uh, Tremper Longman, he's a great commentator on this book. He wrote, the most natural reading of the superscription in wisdom and prophetic literature, literature is that it was added by a second subsequent hand. This is kind of a rule of thumb. It says, however, it is not impossible that the author or speaker wrote the superscription, referring to himself in the third person. So what he does, what Tremper Longman does for us is he says this superscription was very likely written by somebody else, but it's not entirely out of mind or abnormal for an author to speak of himself in the third person and to write these things. But I think when he's thinking of wisdom literature, which is what Ecclesiastes is and Proverbs and some of the Psalms are part of that, and, and even prophetic literature that we see in Scripture, Isaiah and other places, a lot of times those first lines were written by somebody else. In fact, it was rare for the Apostle Paul to write anything himself. He always used a scribe, but many times he would write the closing statements, the epilogue with his own hand and say, I, Paul, did this with my own hand. So it may come as a surprise to you that the Apostle Paul did not write most of his letters, but they certainly came from him because he was dictating. But it is not abnormal in literature, in writing, for someone to write the introduction, for somebody else to write the exit, and for somebody to write the body. So this happens, and I believe that's what we're seeing here. It certainly would be easier to say that Solomon just wrote all this, right? And that's the traditional view. But we're, we're not interested in traditional views if they don't square with reality. And I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't, but traditions can be wonderful, and then traditions can kind of rise above the authority of Scripture, right? When we're all about the, you know, when, when we start to say things like, and I covered this last week, that, well, if Solomon didn't actually write this, because that's what I believed all along, if he didn't actually write this, then I'm not sure the book has any value. Well, that's, that's not a very smart way of thinking, okay? So, but... We, we got somebody else, I believe, right in the superscription. And we do see superscriptions at the beginning of a lot of other biblical books. And as I said, most consistently with the works of prophecy, Isaiah 1.1 and Jeremiah 1.1, Nahum 1.1, those are all examples of prophetic books that have a superscription that was very likely written by someone other than the main author. The main author comes in after that. And sometimes the main author completed his work way in the past, and, and then by the time that the book comes around, it's already in print, but by the time it gets to another place where it's going to be presented, somebody adds statements to the beginning and to the end. Sometimes you see that, and you even see that with Scripture at times. So does that mean that those portions that were written by somebody else a little later, that they're not authoritative? Is it in your Bible? It's authoritative. Just know that as a rule of thumb. So we have that kind of thing going on and playing out here. Um, superscriptions, as I said earlier, are, are found in other wisdom contexts like Proverbs 1.1, Song of Songs 1.1. That's a book you don't want to read with your kids around. And, and the one that is closest to the opening in Ecclesiastes would be found in Proverbs 1.1 sounds almost identical to Ecclesiastes. And I think that's another sign that people use to say, look, I think Solomon wrote both. Well, just because two things sound close doesn't mean they were written by the same person. Uh, in fact, Proverbs 1.1 says, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Okay, just because it says these are Proverbs of Solomon doesn't necessarily mean that Solomon wrote it. They could just be saying these are Proverbs of Solomon. But I think the traditional view might be right about that, that Solomon did write most, if not all, of those Proverbs. Um, the similarity uh, may be part of the frame narrator's strategy of, of near identity between Kohelet and Solomon. It, when you think of Ecclesiastes, there's similarities with Proverbs, and there might be some kind of connection there, or that the frame narrator is, 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 is part of a strategy as he begins 
to introduce Colette or to speak on Colette's behalf, and then Colette is going to take on the persona of Solomon. So there's very close links between Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. But again, that doesn't ensure that it's the same person writing them. In the case of Ecclesiastes, the book's superscription provides the genre, and the genre is, you might be thinking, what is it? Is it fiction? Well, it'd be nonfiction because this is real wisdom and reality, but the genre would be words. <laughs> it's just words. That's the genre. And, and then there is an authorship designation, and that is, how is it in Ecclesiastes 1.1? The preacher, that's Kohelet. It's translated as Kohelet in other translations. And then it says, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So you have some kind of authorship designation, but again, it could be that what the frame narrator is saying and that what Coalette is saying is that we're not, I'm not actually, we're not actually Solomon, but we're speaking on his behalf. And I think that's the way to look at it. You do not have in this superscription something that, that you sometimes see, and, and that's really primarily verse one. You don't have any mention of the subject matter yet. You don't have a date or anything like that. Of course, in biblical writings, there aren't any dates posted, but sometimes there is some kind of reference to the, the material that's coming up. Those things are left unexpressed here. Wouldn't it have been handy if everyone that wrote a biblical book around the 40 authors, they all included dates? Like you could just go right through the Bible and get your chronology right there. You know, I wrote this on, you know, in 64 AD, you know, or whatever. That'd be so handy, but it would take all the mystery out of it, and people would lose their jobs because they'd probably get paid to try to figure that out. In any case, we don't have that. We don't even have subject matter in the superscription. Those things are unexpressed. And then after the superscription, that's verse 1, this frame narrator, this person that wrote this, this prologue part, introduces the words of Kohelet with a popular literary device. Something that was used then, something that's used now. So now we can move to number two. First was the superscription. And now we move to this popular, very, very effective literary device. And that is what I call the attention arresting statement, verse two. Uh, many times when you read a good novel or a good nonfiction or anything that's of decent quality, Someone will begin that book. Maybe it doesn't have a superscription, but maybe it does. But in its introductory, it makes a statement that causes you to say, good Lord, what is going to happen here? I can't wait to read on. Like it's a statement that just grabs your attention, grabs your interest, and causes you, it's like a tractor beam, right? You just, it locks you in and you're like, I cannot believe this person said this. And it causes you to want to read on. And that's a literary device. Good writing has that. It has a catch. It has a hook. And you see that here. And it's in verse 2. Look at this statement. This statement is, 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 is one verse, and it is an absolute summary of Kohelet's thought with a life or in a life apart from God. This statement right here, you can almost just end this series with this statement because there's no statement in this whole book that better represents Kohelet's thought or even the wisdom of Solomon by the time he gets to the end of his life. Here's the attention arresting statement, verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says Kohelet, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. And then here's the hook. All is vanity. Now, in some of your English translations, it says meaningless. But I think vanity is a better word, and it's closer to the Hebrew. But, I mean, what a statement. You read that, and... This guy basically just said that life has no meaning. It's useless. It's worthless. It's meaningless. Is that a catch? Is that a hook or what? Maybe this is why the majority of us and, and, and some of us in this room, this is, this is our favorite book in the Bible, and it's because it has a, a missile blast of an opening statement that just causes you to say, good night, this guy just disqualified everything in life as just vanity. Okay, if that doesn't cause someone to want to read on, I don't think anything will, okay? That, this, this, is, this literary device is good writing. This is good writing. 
not just the fact that the, the that the frame narrator knew to use such a catchy statement to get people hooked, but that the rest of the book is equally as good in, in writing. This is an, an attention-grabbing, attention-arresting statement. When I first read it, I just thought to myself, and this was back when I first got saved, because when you first get saved, you read every bit of Bible all the time, and you understand almost none of it. Uh, but, man, I remember reading this, and I said, I think this guy just said life is just useless. Well, that's pretty much how I felt up to the point that I got saved. So I want to find out what this guy has to say. And that statement alone hooked me and caused me to read the whole book. This person literally just said everything is essentially meaningless. Everything. Everything is meaningless. Everything is vanity. Marriage, buying a car, going to college, building a home, having children. What? Yeah. Everything, nothing has a point is what he's saying. Does that make you want to read on and study it? We're not going to do it. I'm out of here. <laughs> Can you, I mean, this is a big statement. Verse 2 is designed to not only grab our attention, to peak our, but to pique our curiosity, to cause us to say, I'd like to know why this person is saying this. And, and that thought follows, how did this get into the Bible? <laughs> how is a statement, how is something like this in the Bible? It's all my little ponies and feel good. This guy doesn't sound like he, it sounds like he's home with the flu. He sounds like a man to me, because when a man gets a flu, everything is meaningless. Amen, wives? Mm-hmm. Bruce is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This creates, it, 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 it doesn't satiate, it causes a thirst to see what's going on here. It creates a desire to investigate why, Kohelet, why the preacher feels this way. And as I said, verse 2, just verse 2 alone is killer writing. Great writing. Great writing. Some would say that's how every sermon should start, but I'm not that creative. I usually start with verse 1. I'm kind of monotone. I'm kind of boring when it comes to the introduction. I don't write big introductions. I just want to get into the text. Maybe that's because there were times in my history as I was learning that 60% of the sermon was introduction. Boy, did it hook you. But then that 40% was the, the, the actual text. And I'm like, I need more text. I'm not faulting anyone. I'm just saying there's different ways of preaching. But this is just good writing. I don't care what anyone says. That Verse 2 is insane. You just said everything is meaningless. Think about something you enjoy. Meaningless. What are you talking about? Yeah. My, my buddy David's back there. He's, he's planning a wedding. Meaningless. Okay? But not if I'm the DJ. I will bring meaning to your wedding. I will. I will. I'm just kidding. But, I mean, literally, that's what this person's saying. We also see a textual signal that indicates that we are not hearing the voice of Kohelet yet in the appearance of, says the preacher. This is like someone observing what Solomon or Kohelet would say. And this is, I believe, the frame, frame narrator. And, and not everyone holds that position, but I, I've, kind of be con I've been convinced of it, I think, here. I think the frame narrator is speaking in place of the preacher, taking on the persona of Kohelet, just as Kohelet takes on the persona of Solomon later on. Notice that it's third person. The preacher is saying this. Who's the preacher? It ain't me. It's somebody else. Now let's just start to look at some of the wording here. The word vanity is an interesting word. Some render it meaningless or useless, but uh, the ESV, very smart translation. Superior in every way. Just kidding. It's good. It uses the word vanity. And it, it shows up dozens of times in Ecclesiastes. At least the Hebrew root word for vanity shows up that many times. It, it's a vanity. You will hear this word or you will hear the word meaningless over and over and over in Ecclesiastes. And the Hebrew word behind it is havel, havel. And it refers to a breath or vapor, kind of like a puff of smoke rising from a fire or 
like a small cloud of steam rising from your hot breath on a really cold morning. It's been like 70 degrees throughout the days. Yesterday I was hot at this wedding, but man, once the sun went down, it was like 49. I was like, this is weird. So, but think of a, think of Havel meaning like a puff or a, a puff of a vapor or of hot breath or something like that on a frosty morning. That, that's the meaning. And what the author is saying here and what the frame narrator is essentially saying is that life is like that. That's what vanity means. It's a puff of smoke or a puff of vapor. That's the meaning. And what, is, what does it mean for it to be like that? It means that life can be, um, it can be elusive. It can be enigmatic. Um, Egg, I can never say this word, enigmatic. It's a hard word for me to say, enigmatic, meaning it, it, it just doesn't make sense at times. It's confusing. That's the meaning of Havel. It's, it's, it's a puff. It's elusive. It's hard to get your hands on it. It's, it's difficult to understand. How many times have you ever thought to yourself, I just don't understand life. I don't, under, I don't even understand what God wants me to do in this situation or whatever. That's the meaning here of Havel, life is, is so insubstantial that, that when we try to get our hands around it, it slips right through our fingers at times. Life is transitory, right? It's, it appears and then it disappears. It's, as James says, it's a vapor. He uses the, like the, the, the Greek equivalent of Havel and says it's, it's a vapor. It's, it's here one moment, it's gone the next. Um, it's even temporal in a sense. I would say that uh, if you're suffering, and, and some of us have gone through tremendous suffering, not me per se, I, I know it's probably coming, and some of us in this room have gone through quite a bit more suffering, but when you experience a lot of pain and suffering, life seems long and really cruel. But when things are going good, it's over before you know it, you know, isn't it? When we had my, my 50th birthday party for, what am I, 54 now? I can't even keep up with it, man. I was here before Jesus. Um, I remember it was a surprise party, and it, I thought I was going out to, to DJ for a gig. And uh, Brenda is a little liar is what she is, and so is everyone else in this church, a bunch of stinking false witness bearers. And I showed up to do this freebie gig or whatever for Brenda. I thought, oh, I'll just help her out. She's got something. And it turns out to be a surprise party for me. And I had so much fun. It just, it, it went so fast. You know, it was like I showed up and, and heard music and saw a horrific slideshow of me <laughs> with six chins. And it was just bad. And I got the beard to hide it. But it was just, I had so much fun, it was gone like that. It was over before I knew it. And life is like that. It just, when you're having a good time and everything's hitting on all cylinders, it goes by real fast. When you're suffering, it doesn't. But it, it, it is actually still going by really quickly, even when you're suffering. The days come and go. That's the meaning of Havel. It just, it's boom, 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 and it's over. Now you see it, now you don't. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. That's the meaning of vanity. That's the meaning of Havel. The Bible sometimes compares our mortal existence to a vapor. I already alluded to that. According to the psalmist, we are mere breath. Psalm 39.5. Our days will vanish like a breath. There's Havel. Uh, Psalm 78, 33, and of course we know the James text, he said something similar when he described life as a mist that appears for a little time and then it vanishes. James 4, 14, now when you think of that, boy, there's no better place to illustrate that idea of a mist and then it, and then it being gone that same day or in a few hours. There's no better example than the Central Valley. Right? Remember when it gets cold and when winter starts to set? I didn't notice it as much this year, but maybe because we had a warmer winter, I don't know. But you got the fog, right? You wake up and you come out and you, I think my car's out there. Did it get stolen again? My Saturn got stolen like three times. And, and, then, and then by noon or 10 o'clock, that, that fog is gone. That's Havel. That's the meaning. That's the idea. 
To use the word vanity is to say that our brief, transient lives are marked by empty futility. Notice the scope at the end of verse 2. Some things are vanity. Well, I think we would all agree with that statement, but that's not what the author said. That's not what the frame narr narrator said. He said all is vanity. All comes and goes. All has a sense of uh, a bit of futility to it. All seems meaningless at times, undoubtedly. It's all. That's the scope. There is not one single aspect of human existence, according to this frame narrator, who is basically channeling, if you want to use that phrase, I don't know, that sounds almost like Cleo, but he's taking on the persona of, of, of Kohelet. There, he's, he's basically saying there's just not one aspect of human existence that isn't frustrated by futility. It's all empty. It's all pointless. It's all useless. Havel can even mean that life is absurd. Have you ever felt like that? I have. You're in the middle of something, you're like, this is absurd. Of course, what you're actually saying is, I don't deserve this. But that's the meaning of vanity. That's the meaning of Havel. And it's probably like, Havel. Really, it probably has that, that snarl in it, because that's how the Hebrew is. Philip Graham Riken wrote, with encapsulating superlatives, the writer takes the whole sum of human existence and declares that it is utterly meaningless. That's your attention arresting statement. That is Koalet's thought on life, his view of life in a nutshell. And to prove this point, the preacher Coalette will speak as a Solomonic figure and take everything that people ordinarily use, money, pleasure, knowledge, and power, and they use all these things. He will take all these things that people use to give meaning to life and to find satisfaction in life and then show how empty all of it really is. That's the book. Now let's move to our third and final point for today. The introduction to Coalette's summation of life under the sun. Verses 3 to 11. We'll start at 3. This is, this is what the frame narrator says, and he sounds a lot like Coalette, and he sounds identical to Solomon. And what he's attempting to do is just give you a precursor or a taste of the wisdom that Coalette will unpack. Verse 3, what does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? <laughs> okay, we probably ought to call that arresting statement dot two. I mean, hello, what, what do we gain by all our efforts, by all our work, by all our savings, by all our labor, by all our efforts? This verse expresses the programmatic rhetorical question that informs the whole of Ecclesiastes, not just the immediate context. Colette's quest, described in verses 12 to 18, we'll get there, and continued throughout the book, is an attempt to basically answer that question. What does man gain? That's also the purpose of the book, is to show what man gains from living a life merely under the sun. The Hebrew word for gain is yithron, yithron. And it appears 10 times in Ecclesiastes, and it's only in this book in the Old Testament. Yithron is nowhere else in any other book, just in Ecclesiastes. And it is one of several words that are repeated over and over and contribute to the repetitive literary style of Ecclesiastes. How many of you have noticed how repetitive this book is? I'm hoping that I, I don't just handle it in the same way every time week after week so that we all get including me we get bored with it but there is dogmatic level repetition in this book why because this author Kohelet is stressing a point I mean this is also good writing if you want people to get something what do you have to do repeat it over and over and over one of the great adversaries of humanity, Hitler, said, if you, 
If you want people to believe a lie, which he did, you got to say it over and over and over and over. The Jews are bad. The Jews are evil. The Jews, and the next, what, next thing you know, we've got three million of them slaughtered. Why? Because he was such a powerful guy and gifted speaker? No, because he told a lie so many times that people believed him. That's the power of repetition. We kind of get bored with it. It can be tedious. But let me tell you something right now. In Ecclesiastes, there is a ton of repetition. Like I said, I'll try not to make it boring. It's one of the words, yethron is one of the words that's used over and over and over. Uh, havel is one of the words that's used over and over and over. The repetition is there. Other English words that are sometimes used to translate this Hebrew noun are advantage. Maybe you have an English translation that says advantage instead of gain. Another word that we see in some translations is profit. And then probably the next most popular next to gain would be benefit. So those are different English words that are used to transliterate or translate yethron, the Hebrew word. One Hebrew scholar suggests that advantage is the best way to translate the meaning of yethron here in verse 3. I disagree with this person, but he argues that for Kohelet, it's not that labor has no meaning, because that's what's being said. What, is it, what does a person gain from everything they do under the sun, all their hard work? This author thinks that advantage would be the better way to render it, because he doesn't think that Kohelet at some point is going to be saying that all of our work has no meaning. All of our labor is utterly useless. So he likes the word advantage because what this particular scholar thinks is that it's not work in general, but it doesn't give us an extra edge if we work really hard. Now, I think that it does usually give us an advantage if we work really hard. Sometimes it gets the boss's attention. Maybe we get promoted or whatever, but he doesn't think that Coalette later is going to be speaking about labor as a total, but labor is good and it's, it's not meaningless, but it doesn't give us any extra advantages over anything else. That's the perspective of this one particular scholar. And I just, I don't know. I, I think that as we study, we will see that Coalette's scrutiny of labor and, and the meaning of life, it's just going to bring that, it's going to bring those subjects, right? It's going to bring the subject of labor. It's going to bring the subject of meaning of life and those subjects into question at the deepest possible level. So much so that uh, Professor Xiao's interpretation is not going to make much sense. The frame narrator, in other words, the frame narrator is not talking about how labor is not extra advantageous for us. The, the, the frame narrator is saying that labor as a whole does not, it's, it's meaningless at the end of the day. You end up getting nothing for it as you work hard under the sun. And if you just stop and think about that kind of wisdom, what's a statement that we use to summarize that thought? You can't take it with you. Have you ever seen these crazy images and videos where a guy was like, he passed away and he was buried on his Harley? I think he literally said, I'm taking it with me. He's probably thinking, I don't want my wife to sell it, so I'm getting buried on it. But we know that you come into this world with nothing. And when you leave it, you have what? Nothing. And what you possess and worked hard for goes to people who have your favor and deserve it or ends up going to the state which doesn't deserve one more tax from me or it goes to people who didn't earn it. You don't get buried with your wealth and riches. And even if you did, they're going to be consumed by worms. It's a truism to say that you can't take it with you. And that is the, the idea here as well. So, so Kohelet will speak about life as a whole and labor as a whole as meaningless, that it doesn't give us extra advantages. It gives us, in the end, no advantage. That's the point. So Professor Xiao is, is a smart guy, but, and he was at Princeton. He might still be there. I'm not sure where he is. Pepperdine at some point in Princeton, but I don't think so, Professor. Lastly, notice the phrase under the sun at the end of verse 3. This is going to show up so many times. I mean, you're going to be like, you know, people that live in northern Washington have no concept of this because there's no sunlight. 
uh, right? You know, they, they're like, I don't know what that means. I mean, we do. We live in the Central Valley where you get baked like in Alaska. I don't know what baked Alaska is, but it appears 26 times in Ecclesiastes, under the sun, not under the sea, under the sun. You will hear this over and over and up 26 times. So much repetition here. According to Kohelet, what is meant by this incredibly repetitive phrase? What does under the sun mean? What does it refer to? In simple common terms, in general terms, in the most generic way that I can say, it just means life on earth. Okay, that, that, that's kind of the general basic meaning. Under the sun means life under the sun on earth. And yet in Ecclesiastes, it carries a non-religious kind of secular connotation. Uh, it is life on earth under the sun without knowing, fearing, and obeying God. It is life on earth with no life that goes outside of the earth that transcends where your soul is yoked with Jesus Christ, where you're connected with God. It is life under the sun without the sun, S-O-N. That's what it means in Ecclesiastes, and that's why it's repeated so many times. It is a life without God. It is a life without God. And if you want to stress how meaningless that kind of life is, then use that phrase 26 times and bend every argument toward that goal. And that's what Ecclesiastes is about. Now, if you just think about it, I'm going to give you some logic just to prove why life under the sun without Christ is meaningless. Why, and in the immediate context, it's not just life under the sun. He's speaking of labor. What does a man gain by all his toil under the sun? What does he gain? So it's specific here. It'll broaden out. The subject matter will broaden out. It'll get more universal. It'll cover every aspect of life. But it's, it's, it's speaking of labor right here. And that would be maybe the use of tools or the use of knowledge or however it is that you generate money, whatever it is that you do. So here, here is why, according to me, and I think according to the word, why a life of, of hard labor or whatever it is that we do to earn a living under the sun, why it is ultimately meaningless apart from Christ. And that is because it is for Christ, through Christ, by Christ that all things were created. Okay, that's, that's, that's your scripture. That's John 1.3. That's Colossians 1.16, right? So if all things were made by Christ, for Christ, through Christ, and we engage all these things all the time apart from Christ, and Christ is the only one since all things come through him and for ultimately will redound for his glory and therefore his purposes. Believe it or not, everything that exists is for his purposes except for sin. And sin is even used according to his purpose to you know, bring about redemption and these other things. But just think about this. All labor is meaningless apart from Christ. All things are meaningless apart from Christ because he's created all of them. Meaning if we engage them without him, we're, they are meaningless because they all came through him for him. You, you, you don't have, when you don't have Christ, you don't have the purpose for all things. You don't have the creator of all things. You don't have the one who gives meaning to all things. That's why a man's toil under the sun without Christ, the one who created everything for his glory, that's why that life is meaningless, right? You can't take it with you. And even if you have Christ, you can't take it with you. But you have him and he's all you need. But that's the logic behind it. What does a man gain? At the end of the day, when he doesn't have Christ, what does he gain? A paycheck? Last time I checked, most of us live check to check. In this state, it's really hard to live. If it weren't so expensive and difficult, Daryl wouldn't be teasing the idea of moving to Phoenix, where he's really going to live life under the super hot sun. And I'm praying he doesn't go. But I mean... At the end of the day, I did all of this for a paycheck. Just stop and think about where 
the government that has no right to do anything really in our lives except make sure we're safe and we're law abiding somehow came up with the retirement age so that you work your tail off under the sun your whole life and then retire to only live for two or three years in your retirement? Talk about meaningless. But if you know Christ, it has meaning. It has value. It has purpose. What you do means something, doesn't it? See, that's, that's, that's the idea here. That's the idea. Christ is the only one who can give meaning, value, and purpose to all things because he created all things for him, through him, to him. When all things are engaged for oneself apart from Christ, that is life under the sun. And it will prove to be vanity and meaningless. How is it that throughout even American history, Howard Hughes and some of the wealthiest people who have ever lived had anything and everything you could imagine. They could have bought Wonka's chocolate factory. I wish it existed. According to Kelly, it does. But I mean, dying in a cheap, cruddy hotel room, talk about meaningless. Because it doesn't matter what you gather to yourself, what you earn, what you capture, what you invest in at the end of the day. I'm not saying that these things aren't good things. It's good to leave a legacy. But at the same time, and without Christ, the one who gave you all these things for a particular reason, they just, you end up dying without any of it. And none of any of that can even take you to paradise. Now, it, it just, it's going to prove to be vanity and meaningless. And I'll tell you what, if we could hear voices from the grave, voices from hell, I, I don't know if they would tell us this or not, because I think they're embittered down there, but they might tell us that I had more money than anyone, and look at me now. The phrase under the sun is also evangelistic, by the way. That's why it appears so many times, 26 times, because it has a connotation of evangelism. When we combine it with six exhortations to fear God, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3.14 and chapter 5, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 18, chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, chapter 12, verse 13. So you have this under the sun phrase, and when you combine it with this exhortation, another repeated exhortation to fear God, when you combine those two things, you've got evangelism. You've got Coalette's message of salvation. Life under the sun is meaningless. Fear God. That's evangelism. To whom? To his Hebrew neighbors who were influenced by Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And what were those types saying? They're saying the same things that Americans say today. You know what? Life is all there is, so just live it up. That's who Colette is writing this to. I think it was written in the third century BC, and it was written to, you know, Hellenistic Jews who were highly influenced by the Epicurean and Stoics who said, Life doesn't have any meaning, live it up. Use your body how you want. Do what you want. Hebrews were like, okay, just like they were in the wilderness. The author's saying, uh-uh. That's all vanity, by the way. Coalette obliterates this carnal, under-the-sun worldview and challenges his readers to turn their eyes upward to behold the beauty, glory, and majesty of God in heaven who alone gives meaning and value and purpose and future glory to those who repent and trust in Christ. He, God alone, if he is the creator of every life and the creator of all creation, then it would be true of him that only, him can give, only he can give meaning to any of it. Just think logically. It's part of our Christian worldview. We don't like what we see happening in the world, but we know God is a redeemer and can make great things and good things come from terrible things. But if you don't have the Lord and understand these things, you just see terrible things. 
And so often you blame God for it. If he was loving, why would he allow these things to happen? Why would we have the sound of freedom out if God was loving? So you don't see those who are rescuing children out of sex trafficking as an expression of God's love? See, you corrupted. You don't even think about the good that can come out of that. I think it's a terrible situation, but God is a redeemer. And, and Cole, that just obliterates this whole under the sun idea. The life apart from God is literally meaningless. Verses 4 to 7, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down. It hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. Verse 7, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. Okay. Can anyone guess this literary style or writing? This is poetry. This sounds like Job, doesn't it? Does that not sound like something that Job's friends would say or Job would say? The, the frame narrator here is providing a taste of the kind of poetry that Coalette will employ to illustrate the tedious finitude of life under the sun. He also hints at the reason why there isn't any real gain to man as he toils under the sun. Nothing ever changes except perhaps time. There's nothing new under the sun. That's another phrase that appears here repetitively. And if you think about it, anything that's being done today was done in the past, understood in the past. There's really nothing new. The idea here is that generations come and go, but the earth doesn't go anywhere. The sun goes up and down, it rises, it falls, and it hastens to its former place. It's funny, because when I go to bed, it's over here. When I wake up, it's over here. But it's really not the sun moving, it's the earth. But it's always, I mean, if you wake up one morning and the sun isn't where it should be, we're in trouble. You can bank on it. It's a sure thing. That's the idea here. It resets. It keeps going back. The wind blows from south to north sometimes, from north to south. It goes around and around and around, but it actually rides on its own circuits. There's wind patterns, and they can almost be, in most cases, they can be predicted. All streams run to the sea, but the sea doesn't overflow. Has that one ever boggled your mind? All these streams and rivers are all pouring into the ocean, but the, the ocean's the same level. Why doesn't it? It should be up to Modesto by now. It's kind of weird. And I think the frame narrator is thinking of the Dead Sea there, because that's the best possible example of this. That would be the region he lived. The Jordan River empties into the Dead Sea from the north, but the Dead Sea is never filled. And guess what the Dead Sea doesn't have? It doesn't have, any, it doesn't have any rivers or anything going out of it. So, so this river, and it's, the Jordan is mighty in Scripture. It's constantly pouring into the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea doesn't have any outlets. There's nothing coming out of it, and the water doesn't rise. It just kind of sits there, stagnated. It's the lowest place on earth, but it never, I mean, shouldn't it be like the giant sea by now with all that water pouring into it? Okay, the, the, the point is not science or geography. The point is that there is a boring mundanity to life under the sun. We go to work, we come home like generations come and go on earth. Huh? Some of you are retired now, but you remember that. Getting up when the sun is barely up and getting ready and going to work and coming home. You did that over and over and over for how many years? We rise in the morning and then hasten to our beds just as the sun rises and hastens to its former place. We go about our daily routines. We move from one place to another like the wind blows here and there. We run from one thing to the next and yet are never filled, just as all streams flow to the seas and are never filled. 
The poetry has parallels to normal life. Have you ever just felt like, I am so tired of this wreck, the life I live? Getting up and going to work, going to bed, waking up throughout the whole night, then finally getting up the morning exhausted, having screaming kids, having a cruddy boss, and, and, and doing this and doing that, and doing the same old vacations, unless it's Disneyland. Just, you just, <laughs> the mundanity of life, eating the same, have you ever said to yourself, I am starving, but nothing sounds good? That's the mundanity of life. Life itself can be mundane. It's so repetitive that one day you can actually stop amidst all of it and say, this stinks. And some people don't just say, this stinks. They say, I want something different. And then they move to Guam. <laughs> and the only difference is good weather. But they get up and they go fishing and then they go over here and it's this, it, wherever you go, the mundanity is there because you're there. Some people have uh, golden age thinking. No, I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about a movie. My wife is like, shut your mouth. Just mouth that to me. But it, it is, okay, listen, I think we all have golden age thinking. If you've ever said this to yourself, things were a lot better when I was a teen, golden age thinking. I have been trying to get back to the 80s since the 80s. And I have no idea why, because I smoked weed and did acid and ran around like an idiot. Why would I want to go back to that? But it's not that I want to go back to that. I want to go back to being a teenager and running around and having a good time and going to Modesto Reservoir and looking at the water, <laughs> right? I mean, that's golden age thinking. Some of you would be more suited for the 20s. You feel like you want to go back to the time where authorship, I mean, you got the Hemingway and all that. I get it. I understand it. We all have that. Some of us would like to go back to an, an era, a bygone era, where we had certain people in our lives that aren't there anymore. Sometimes I think about, man, it'd be neat to go back 10 years in this church, and then I can actually go back by listening to one of my old sermons, and I go, I should never return. I felt like it was that bad. Not that it's all that much better today, but I mean, we all, we all struggle with this, right? And, and that's because there is a mundanity to life. There is a repetition to life. That's the meaning of Havel. That's what the, the frame narrator is talking about. Even the frame narrator has felt this way. Coalette has felt this way. And probably nobody in the history of the world ever felt it more than Solomon because he tried everything and could never get out of the mundanity. When we stop and think about the regular rituals and repetition of life, I think it can be a bit depressing, amen? If you've ever just said, I, I just want a different life. And this is why we say things like, gosh, I don't want to get up tomorrow morning and go to work. You're expressing the feeling and emotion of the frame narrator of Coalette and of Solomon. We all feel the mundanity of life under the sun, and we all complain about it from time to time. We're all under the impression that if we were to change our lives, they would be much better, but after a while, they would be mundane. Now, ponder this. Our lives, one day, they're going to come to an end, okay? And that's, that's, you know, well, I'm a strong Christian, and I don't fear death. Well, you're nowhere near dying as far as I can tell, and that's why you're saying that. You've got a big mouth. When death is hugging you, I don't think you'll be going, oh, come on, Jesus, let's go. Where's my chariot? You'll be scared. But point being, we're all going to die someday. But guess what's going to happen when we die? Everything around us will go on. You ever stop to think about that? That's a little scary to me. It's not because I'm a narcissist or I'm so into myself. 
that I'm about to say this, but the existence that I understand more than any other existence would be my own existence. And it is difficult for me to fathom or to imagine the world going on without me. Not because I'm so important to the world, but I can't imagine a world without me in it, and I can't imagine me not being in the world. It's all I know. So it is a scary thought to think about. I'll drive up and down McHenry all the time, and I'll look at a building and say, that building is going to outlive me. And it's a weed shop. <laughs> Have you ever thought this way? Driving over the 7th Street Bridge, which was there in 4000 BC. I mean, the lions don't even have noses on the end of it. They're gone. I think some methods like, Aah! you know. But I mean, you're driving over this bridge, and that bridge has been there for 100 years. And I say to myself, it doesn't look like it's going to outlive me, but I think it will. And that's weird. How can everything go on without me in it? I don't. It's not that I want it to end with me, but I, 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 it's what I know and it's what I'm familiar with. And it's a scary thought to think that this building will very likely be here after I'm dead. And I pray that this church is here. But I also can't imagine this church without me in it. Not because I mean so much to the church, but it's what I know, it's what I understand. Oh, it's, just a, it's just a weird thing. The, the homes that I've lived in throughout my life are going to outlive me. They're going to be around, and they'll have different tenants, different owners, and it just nobody can live in this house but me. I'll burn it down on my deathbed. It's a rental. You know, the landlord's going to be like, what the heck was he thinking? The homes that I lived in, they're gonna, the, the, the buildings that I drive by, all these things are going to outlive me. And not being in this world and having it continue without me is kind of a scary thought. It fills me with anxiousness. It makes me feel kind of sick if I really stop and think about it. Now consider how depressing and even terrifying it might be for those who do not know Christ. Isn't this one of the reasons why unbelievers keep themselves so busy with stuff? They don't want to tease the idea of not being here or dying or not having their possessions anymore. See, it's, it's hard on Christians when you really stop and give a cerebral approach to this kind of thinking. Think about it, but it's way worse on unbelievers. This is the sentiment the frame narrator in later Coalette seeks to convey. We live, we die, the world goes on without us. What is the point to it all? There is no point to any of it under the sun. We must shift our focus from the transient, the here and now, to the transcendent, from earth to heaven. And only then will any of it begin to make sense. And only then can we have a hope and a future where we'll be glad to leave this world and we'll be fine with it going on without us, provided that our families are taken care of. And that's our responsibility. That's the idea here. Verse 8, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. This might be one of the greatest statements ever made. In verse 8a, the frame narrator expresses Colette's summation of the end result of man's striving under the sun. What will it produce? A life that is rich in purpose, satisfaction, and true happiness? No, man's reward will be unspeakable weariness. Verse 8b, he uses more poetry to describe why this is true. It sounds just like a proverb to me. In fact, I didn't know if you knew this or not, but Ecclesiastes is chock full of all sorts of proverbs. The reason is because the eye can never be satisfied by what it sees, nor the ear ever satisfied by what it hears. In other words, that which exists under the sun, work, pleasure, riches, and so on, will not truly satisfy those who pursue such things because creation itself cannot replace what is missing inside every fallen sinner, what Blaise Pascal called the God-shaped hole in the heart. There is a great gap, a chasm between God and fallen humanity. When God created Adam and Eve, he, he walked and talked with them every day. They had sweet fellowship. They had an amazing relationship. 
But when they sinned, the spiritual connection between God and man was broken. Because of this, there is a, as Pascal says, a God-shaped hole in every human heart. Augustine understood this very well. He wrote in his Confessions, which everyone in this room should read. He wrote, and he's speaking to God, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Humanity has been trying to fix this problem ever since by taking everything under the sun and attempting to cram it into the God-shaped hole. And the end result is always the same. Satisfaction? No. The author says it right here in verse 8a. Weariness! You will not have satisfaction. Creation was never designed to fill this hole. It was never designed to satisfy our deepest longings. Only the Creator can do this in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the puzzle piece. He alone fits the God-shaped hole. Until the Lord inhabits the soul, man will continue to seek lasting fulfillment under the sun. But his eye will never see enough, and his ear will never hear enough. And he will grow weary from trying and trying and trying and trying. He will never get there. That's what is being said in verse 8. This book is filled with that kind of wisdom. Verses 9 and 10, what has been will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. There it is. Is there a thing of which it is said? See, this is new. And he says, it has already been done in the ages before us. And the frame narrator espouses Kohelet's wisdom concerning new shiny objects, Every generation discovers old truths. There's nothing new under the sun. The wise do not boast because they understand that what they have found, whatever discovery they've made, they know it was always there. So the wise say, I didn't find something new. They say, I found something, and I'm glad I found it. And yet the foolish, however, they see their discoveries as entirely new. And they let everyone know how intelligent and diligent they are. They are under the impression that there is always something new and that what they find or create will bring true satisfaction. This is the goal and pursuit of modern science. How would Kohelet deal with such misguided thinkers? Look at the end of verses 9 and 10. There is nothing new under the sun. It has already been in ages before us. This is way, his way of saying and warning in wisdom, do not think there are new shiny objects that will satisfy your deep needs and bring you rest. They do not exist. You know what people need to discover? the ancient of days, the one who has always been. Verse 11, there is no remembrance of foreign things, nor will there be a former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after. Last verse, the frame narrator ends his prologue with one last taste of Kohelet's wisdom before Kohelet takes the pen this time he speaks of remembrances. I'm reminded of the period in Israel's history when the Israelites were ruled by judges. During this time, the people did not remember former things, namely God himself, his deliverance, nor his law. <laughs> judges 2.13, Judges 8.34, Judges 21.25 all speak to this. A brief history lesson uh, of Israel's lack of remembrance, remembrance, however, is not why the author is hinting at this in verse 11. This verse explains why what appears novel to us is really not new, but a repeat of something old. Old things seem new to us because we have forgotten or are ignorant of them, but they're not new. They might be new to us, but they're not new. Writing a commentary on a biblical book is a good example. Writing sermons is a great example as well. You know, during research, a scholar or pastor might, you know, become excited over what he thinks is a new discovery, only to find the exact same thought expressed in some other commentary. And he says, I didn't find anything new. Woe is me. 
But verse 11 does more than reveal our ignorance of the past. It reminds us, and this is the point, it reminds us that we should not expect anything different in the future. Those generations that follow us will be ignorant of who we are and of what we are doing, just as we are ignorant of the past and of those who preceded us. Thus, here's the point, true satisfaction will not be found in the past, nor in the future, nor in the present. As long as it's life under the sun, it doesn't matter what happened in the past, what's happening now, or what's happening in the future. In the end, it will be vanity. Because some people are so hopeful and optimistic about the future. That's what they place their hope in. I know things will change. It's going to get better. <laughs> the frame narrator is saying, no, there's nothing new. So don't be thinking that you'll find meaning in five years. It's still going to be vanity. That's the idea. Verse 11 is intended to ruin the foolish idea of believing that we can find something from the past or something in the present or something from the future that will fill the God-shaped hole and bring us true satisfaction. Jesus made absolutely clear that he alone can meet our deepest need and end our pursuit of trying to find meaning, value, purpose, and satisfaction under the sun. He is the living water who quenches our spiritual thirst. He is the bread of life who satisfies our spiritual hunger. John 2, 10 to 15, John 6, 35. When he makes those statements, one to the woman at the well and to others in chapter 6, he is saying that you won't find it in the past, you won't find it in the present, you won't find it in the future, you won't find it in labor, you won't find it in sex, you won't find it in rock and roll, you won't find it in dreaming about the, the past, you won't find it at work, you won't find it in your marriage, you won't find it in your children, you won't find it anywhere. You can never, ever, ever be satisfied at the deepest level unless you drink of me, unless you eat of me. Jesus made it clear. And that is the point of the book. However, as I end, trusting in Christ is a wonderful thing. It is the work of the Spirit in our soul. Repentance and faith are gifts given by the Spirit. It's not just us doing it on our own. When we trust in Christ, it is evidence that the Spirit has made us new, and now we can do this. It's a wonderful thing, but you need to understand that trusting in Christ will not put an end to every longing. It won't. It won't. Our flesh has cravings, and we will battle them. But trusting in Christ will satisfy our deepest longing. And over time, it will transform all the other longings. May we trust in Christ and be satisfied by his deep. I, I, there's nothing that I have, no tool in my vocabulary, no word in the English dictionary that I can use to capture or to present or to accurately represent the love of Christ for those whom he's redeemed. It is deeper than the Marianas Trench. It goes beyond anything in creation. It is so deep and so profound. So may we trust in him and may we experience and cling to and pursue his unfairness unfathomable deep, his unfathomable riches and grace, but his unfathomable love. And be satisfied by that deep, profound, agapow love. That's how the longings change when we move from longing the stuff under the sun to longing the one who loves with the purest, most satisfying, most explosive, most enduring, most unconditional love, the love of 